Welcome back to the Dornsife Dialogues as we kick off the new academic year. Those of you who tune in frequently might be thinking something seems different here, and you would be right. I am Mo Najjar, and I am serving as the interim dean of USC Dornsife. While Dornsife might be in a time of transition, we continue to push full speed ahead on our research, teaching, and signature programming for our extended Dornsife community. Our event today, as always, will offer research insights that may change the way you think, and today, in particular, might help you think even better. For years, we've been told that the keys to brain health are the Sunday crossword puzzle and fish oil. But the latest science suggests that the secret to a sharp mind could actually be your gut. That's right, the same gut you might be indulging right now if you're part of our lunch hour live stream has a direct line to your brain. They're in constant conversation through what researchers call the gut-brain axis. I know, I know, it's easy to think this is the latest clickbait. One day we hear that a nightly glass of wine is how you live to 100. The next we hear that heart failure is just a sip away. But this brain-gut connection is now well-established and their chatter has a huge impact on our overall health. Our expert panel will help us understand this link, revealing how your stomach's so-called second brain influences everything from your mood to your memory. We will also hear about which foods can supercharge your brain health and why your gut feelings matter more than you think. So let's get started. Our moderator is Dana G. Smith. Dana is a reporter for the New York Times, known for her insightful articles on mental health, neuroscience, and wellness. Her work has also been featured in Scientific American, The Atlantic, The Guardian, and NPR. Dana earned her PhD in experimental psychology from the University of Cambridge, and she's one of our own, a proud USC Dornsife alum with a bachelor's degree in psychology. I'll hand it over to Dana, who will introduce our panelists, and I'd like to thank everyone once again for tuning in. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I think we're gonna have a, a really exciting conversation about how the gut influences the brain. Uh, with us today, we have Dr. Scott Konoski. Dr. Konoski is a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at USC, who studies the neurobiology of obesity onset, treatment, and pathophysiology. His NIH-funded research focuses on how gut-to-brain signaling affects memory and cognition via the microbiome and the vagus nerve. Additional areas of his research program include understanding how gut and brain-derived peptides influence appetite control and unraveling the mechanisms via which early life diet influences brain and cognition. Dr. Konoski has held leadership positions in premier scientific societies, including the Society for the Study of Ingestive Behavior and the Obesity Society. He is presently the co-director of the USC Obesity and Diabetes Research Institute. Also with us today is Dr. Lindsay Shear. Dr. Shear is an assistant professor of biological sciences at USC and a neuroscientist by training. Her NIH-funded research program broadly focuses on understanding how the chemicals in the foods and fluids that we consume such as nutrients and toxins, are sensed at critical processing sites in the body, including through the taste system and in the gut, and how this information is signaled to the brain to influence our dietary behaviors, what we eat, and how much we eat. A second aim of Dr. Shear's research is to determine how the diet itself impacts these gut-brain sensory systems across the lifespan, especially during vulnerable periods of development, to produce lasting effects on food choice and, in turn, health. Dr. Konoski, Dr. Shear, thank you so much for joining us today. So I guess just to get us started, you know, the gut and the brain seem like really separate organs. How are they connected? You know, what's the evidence that one can actually influence the other? Yeah, so uh, thank you for the, the introduction. Um, and yeah, I, I guess just to kind of take a step back, survival really depends um, in large part on our ability to extract nutrients from the environment um, for energy, but also for the health and maintenance of all the cells in our body. Um, and we have to do that while also avoiding potential toxins in our environment. Um, so many animals, including humans, have evolved really intricate um, and strong pathways of communication between the organs that are at the front lines of this, um, our stomach, our intestines, um, and the brain to coordinate all of the events that will make this possible. 
Um, the vagus nerve is really the major nerve that connects all of these our vital organs. So that includes the heart, the lungs, um, and relevant to this discussion, the gastrointestinal tract to the brain. Um, the vagus nerve um, is primarily a sensory nerve, meaning that it's sensing what's going on in these organs, how much food is coming in, what types of foods are coming in, um, and it's providing that rapid information back to the brain. So the brain can then in turn process this and send information back, um, sort of what, how to respond to that. For instance, slow digestion, increased digestion um, rates and so on. So uh, there are other signals that connect the gut and the brain too. Uh, for example, there are hormones that are released uh, from the cells that line the gut. Um, and those can also engage with the vagus nerve and they can travel through the bloodstream to interact with uh, other organs that are off um, at more distant sites. And that includes the brain. Um, and so this whole thing sort of forms a very intricate network of communication that really enables the brain to keep tabs on what's happening in the body, the body's physio physiology, and then um, adapt and respond in ways um, that promote health and well-being. Great. Um, I mean, it seems most intuitive that the gut and the brain would communicate, you know, how hungry or how full we are. Um, so what are those messages and, and how are they contributing to our weight? Uh, thanks, Dana, for the invitation and the opportunity to join the conversation. But Lindsay mentioned the vagus nerve, which is a primary conduit of communication between the gut and the brain. And, and one of the signals that is communicated through the vagus nerve that tells us that we're full is when the stomach distends. So when our stomach expands when we're eating food, this signal is, is sent to the brain through the vagus nerve, and this contributes to us becoming full and, and eventually terminating a meal. What Lindsay also mentioned is that we have a variety of hormones that are secreted from specialized cells in our intestines and, and in our stomach. Most of these hormones contribute to us becoming full, leading to a process called satiation or meal termination. And we may talk about a few of these uh, throughout the conversation, but they include cholecystokinin, uh, glucagon-like peptide 1. Um, both of these will slow the rate of uh, partially digested food transit through our intestines. And this leads us to become full and, and want to stop consuming food. Although many of you are probably potentially eating during this conversation. It might be at the early stage of that meal and are not yet getting those satiation signals. And there's also uh, one of my favorite hormones called ghrelin, which is secreted from specialized cells in the stomach. And this hormone is, is unique in that it actually contributes to us feeling hungry to want to initiate a meal. And its release is quite complicated, but uh, one of the components that leads to ghrelin release is based on meal anticipation. So if many of you are about to start a meal, uh, you may have ghrelin being released from these cells and getting into circulation and eventually talking to the brain and, and telling you that it's time to eat. And I'll just, there's, there, oh, I was okay. just going to add to that. Um, you know, I focus so much on the signals that stop the meal, um, but most of us really enjoy eating. And that's because our brain is really hardwired to derive pleasure from food. And so on a conscious level, we think about this in terms of how a food tastes. Is it really sweet or salty, um, the sort of enjoyable, enjoyable, palatable sensations. Um, but there's a lot going on subconsciously too, and that includes from the gut. Um, and so as certain foods are being processed there, they engage um, many of these same sensors and other signals along the gut that transmit signals to the brain's reward areas. These are the areas that tell us to keep eating. Um, and so maybe if you're early in, in your lunch, that's those are the signals you're getting now. Um, and fats and sugars are really especially um, good at engaging these reward pathways. Um, and, and not only are these signals happening in real time, but they can also, which can you know, promote overeating in a meal and maybe um, encourage you to make room for dessert, but they also um, happen over the long term and shape the way we eat over uh, over the over our lifetime. Um, so the brain is sort of tracking this type of positive feedback. It remembers when you eat something nutritious um, or foods that engage this reward pathway and uses that to guide your appetite or your decision about what to eat in the future. So we gradually find these rewarding foods more and more appealing and we'll seek them out even. Um, and so I think this is partly what makes it very difficult for us to steer away from foods that might be unhealthy when they're in consumed in excess. 
Dr. Konoski, you mentioned the glucagon like peptide one or glucagon like peptides. Uh, and we we're hearing a lot about GLP-1 agonists these days, like Ozempic and Manjaro for weight loss. Um, how do these drugs work to reduce those feelings of hunger? Uh, great, great question, Dana. So GLP-1 is a hormone that we, we have endogenously produced in our body, and it's produced from the distal intestine. So we have specialized L cells that secrete GLP-1 during a meal, and that contributes to the slowing of the transit of nutrients through the GI tract and leading us to become full. Endogenously, it has a very short half-life, which means it doesn't last very long in circulation. So it contributes to feeling full while eating, but it doesn't stay into circulation. It's degraded within a few minutes after its release. So just giving someone GLP-1 would not be an effective pharmacotherapy for appetite control and, and weight loss because it's it's very short acting. However, uh, pharmaceutical companies have developed modified versions of GLP-1 agonists that have a much longer half-life. So the first generation um, 10 plus years ago would have about a two to three hour half-life. And these compounds were given twice a day for diabetes control and, and in some cases for weight loss. A next generation had a longer half-life of about 12, 13 hours. So these were given once a day. And as many of you may know, that the current generation of GLP-1 agonist and, and co-agonist have a half-life that's quite long and, and are injected in many cases once per week. And what this is doing is it's essentially making the endogenous GLP-1 system on full speed all the time. So these, these drugs are lasting a very long time, and this is mimicking what GLP-1 is doing from the intestines to slow the rate of partially digested nutrients through the GI tract. Another interesting thing about the GLP-1 system is GLP-1 is produced in another place in our body, and that's in the brainstem. So there's a, a set of neurons in our brainstem that make GLP-1, and they communicate throughout the brain. And they do very similar things to the intestinal GLP-1 in that they contribute to us uh, becoming full, meal termination, but also can reduce uh, reward processing because the receptors for GLP-1 are expressed in our brain's mesolimbic reward system. And with the GLP-1 agonists that are used for diabetes control and weight loss, they're acting on the receptors in the periphery, but they're also getting into the brain. So very much of what is happening and how these drugs are effective involves getting into the brain from the blood and acting on GLP-1 receptors in the brain to contribute to feeling full and potentially to make things less rewarding. And because of that, there's some interest in whether or not these drugs may have some efficacy for treatment of substance abuse disorders, but the research on that front is in its infancy at this point. Um, what about other mental health conditions? You know, is there a link between the brain and, um, you know, depression or anxiety, for instance? You know, is, is the gut influencing other aspects of our mental health? Yeah, I think, you know, we know from, from human fMRI studies that the activity of the gut um, and, and the hormones that are produced there, the signals that are coming up through the vagus nerve um, and other nerves are really processed in nearly every major part of the brain. So really meaning that these events can impact many different things, how you're feeling, your mood, the decisions that you're going to make moment to moment. Um, and so I think there's high potential in, in emerging evidence that um, what's going on in the gut can influence um, other aspects of um, brain function. And anxiety and depression are, are really complex conditions, right? So they probably have very complex etiologies or causes. Um, and so the, uh, I think you'll, you'll, the vagus nerve being the major nerve that connects all of our internal organs to the brain, the, the FDA has um, approved vagal nerve stimulation, which involves a small implantable device onto the left vagus nerve that can trigger electrical pulses in this nerve and send that in, in sort of trigger that electrical stimulation to the brain. And this has been, um, been approved for treatment of depression in certain individuals. Um, and these devices were actually first developed to treat epilepsy. Um, um, and it was noticed from those patients' reports and from their clinical researchers looking at them uh, that they were noting parallel improvements in their overall mood. And so later studies in humans um, with major depressive dis disorder 
um, confirm that, that this, this type of stimulation of the vagus nerve reduced those depressive symptoms in many of these individuals. Um, and I think we're still trying to understand how this works. Um, as I mentioned, it's the vagus nerve is sort of connected um, to very, various parts of the brain. Um, but at least on one level, it seems that vagal nerve stimulation can increase uh, serotonin levels in the brain. And so serotonin is one of the brain's um, sort of feel-good chemicals, if you will. Um, and it's, it's oftentimes found to be low in individuals that have depression. And so stimulation of this nerve can maybe rescue production of this really important neurotransmitter. Um, so that's just one theory of, I think, as I said before, it's pretty complex and there's likely other factors at play. Um, and we know just sort of also in terms of anxiety that that um, activity in this nerve um, is linked to anxiety. And this maybe is a little bit more complex. Uh, we know from animal studies, um, for example, that stimulating the vagus nerve can reduce anxiety-like behaviors or fear, fearful responses. Um, but there's also evidence that if you remove uh, signaling through this pathway that you can eliminate um, anxiety-like responses in, in these animal studies. So this is really probably more a matter of intensity. So certain level of activity along this pathway is, is good, maybe provides a sort of vigilance um, in your environment, but too much can be very stressful um, potentially and, and not enough um, in uh, sort of dramatically reduce anxiety. So I think this will be really important to kind of consider as this um, maybe becomes a potential treatment for anxiety disorders in humans. I don't think the science is quite there yet, but um, that, you know, there's, I think there's a lot of promising preclinical data out there that um, supports that these two things could be linked. That's fascinating. Um... What about cognitive health? You know, is there evidence that our gut is also influencing like our memory or cognition or even a risk for dementia? Uh, yes, actually there is. It's very new emerging evidence, but there's a brain region called the hippocampus, which is very famous. Brain region in neuroscience is important for specific types of learning and memory processes. So one example is if you think about our lunch yesterday, think about where we were, who we were with, what we were doing, the hippocampus is important for remembering those kind of episodes. It's also critical for navigating through space, for knowing where something is located, for remembering where you parked your car, for example. And there's been recent evidence, largely from preclinical animal models, suggesting that there's a connection between the gut and the hippocampus through the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve doesn't communicate directly to the hippocampus, but through sort of a multi-synaptic pathway. Uh, it does seem to be promoting memory function and, and hippocampal function. In preclinical atom models, the evidence for this comes in many ways, but in one instance, if you damage the vagus nerve, animals start to have problems remembering hippocampal-dependent types of learning and, and memory processes. Um, there's also some evidence that is consistent with this in humans. So the hippocampus is not just important for memory, but it's also one of the first brain regions to be uh, impaired when it comes to Alzheimer's and other types of dementia. And in some cases, humans used to get vagotomies, so they would get the vagus nerve at the level of the gut removed to help with ulcerative colitis. And in populations that had this, it's been shown that if you had a vagotomy for colitis, there's an increased risk of, of dementia. So there is some evidence out there in humans, but it's it's very new and it's just emerging at this time. Uh, on the flip side of that, Lindsay was mentioning vagal nerve stimulation. So as she mentioned, this has been approved already for depression and epilepsy. There's also an FDA approved vagal nerve stimulation device for, for weight loss and for obesity. And there's some interest in whether VNS, the acronym for vagal nerve stimulation, can be efficacious in, in dementia and other syndromes where there's cognitive impairment. And the preclinical evidence from uh, largely from rodent models is consistent with that. So if you have a vagal nerve stimulation in a rat or a mouse, this can promote plasticity in the hippocampus, which is a way that neurons form memories. And there's also evidence in transgenic models of Alzheimer's that a vagal nerve stimulation device may have efficacy for attenuating the negative pathology associated with 
Alzheimer's in these animals. So this is a very new and emerging area of research, but there is some promise that we may be able to influence uh, memory impairments and dementia through through the gut. And uh, just one more example, I was talking about GLP-1 previously. GLP-1 also has receptors in this hippocampus brain region. And there's some uh, clinical trials being conducted currently to try to look at whether there's any efficacy of the GLP-1 analogs that are currently used for diabetes and obesity in conditions like mild cognitive impairment and even the early stage of Alzheimer's. Okay, so we've talked a lot about the vagus nerve and about peptides, um, but you know we can't talk about the gut without mentioning the gut microbiome. So can you tell us a little bit about kind of what that is and how that's also influencing our brains? Yeah, so so the gut microbiome is um, it's essentially a colony or um, an ecosystem of microorganisms. Uh, those would be viruses and fungi, but mainly bacteria that inhabit our intestines. Um, and so our our understanding of this colony um, is really in its infancy. Um, and I, I would say it's really within the last two decades, thanks to many technological advances in the field um, that we've been able to learn about what these microbes are and what they do in the gut. Um, and the, the intestine is, um, is sort of home to the largest um, colony, I, I guess, in, in the human body and it's host trillions of microbes. Um, and in fact, this is sort of a statistic that really um, uh, impresses me that there's, we have far more microbial genes in our bodies than we do of actual human genes. So they really are um, a major part of us. Um, and they play really important roles in our health too. So um, they locally, they help us digest the foods um, that we can't digest very well, such as fiber, um, but they also can help to maintain the, the integrity of the intestinal surfaces. So it helps uh, prevent foreign, um, you know, sort of toxins and other things from getting in. Um, and emerging data suggests that they can influence lots of things about the host physiology, metabolism and other aspects of immunity. So um, this is, as I mentioned, a new field um, and we're learning more and more about what these things are doing, but it's very clear they, they, have, uh, they play, have a large influence on our overall physiology and health. Another hot topic uh, that we hear about a lot on the Well Desk, the New York Times, is inflammation. Um, and I'm curious, you know, what is what exactly does inflammation mean when it comes to our guts, and and how is that influencing our health, you know, both in our stomachs and also in our brains? The microbiome is, as Lindsay mentioned, a very new field of research. So we're really just learning about this now. Prior to 2012, there was essentially no microbiome research. Um, we do know that with regards to inflammation, there are populations of bacteria that have been identified that are, are anti-inflammatory, and there are other populations of bacteria that are pro-inflammatory. So there's this balance going on between bacterial populations that can have different impacts on inflammation. And in when we consume foods that uh, promote weight gain that are high in, in sugar and, and saturated fatty acids, this can lead to increased uh, inflammation. And in fact, individuals with obesity have, have chronic low-grade inflammation. And the mechanisms through which dietary factors and metabolic factors are influencing inflammation through the microbiome are just starting to, to be understood now um, as being such a new area of research. Lipopolysaccharide is, is one endotoxin that has been studied uh, for many years now, and that is an endotoxin that is a pro-inflammatory signal that uh, increases inflammation that leads to a leaky uh, gut. So our gut has tight junction cells that keep things in and keep other things out, and LPS is a derived from bacteria in our gut. And Diets high in sugar and saturated fatty acids can lead to increased levels of LPS, which can uh, start to chew away at the gut barrier, get into circulation, and lead to an overall pro-inflammatory state. Right. So, you know, what does it look like to have a gut-healthy diet then? You know, what are the things that we know are good for our guts and good for our gut microbiome? And what are the things, you know, like you mentioned, you know, maybe high sugar foods that maybe are causing inflammation and causing us to have gut problems? We know more about what's bad than what's good. Um, we know that high sugar diets can lead to 
uh, altered microbiome that may be functionally connected to metabolic dysfunction and even cognitive impairment. Uh, when it comes to what's good to eat, uh, fiber is certainly something that uh, thrives in the microbiome. So the bacteria in the microbiome use fiber as a substrate to create short chain fatty acids, uh, which are actually beneficial for us. So they're a source of energy in the colon, but also get into circulation and have beneficial effects on our brain and anti-inflammatory effects as well. So a high fiber diet or a, a prebiotic would be beneficial in terms of feeding our, our gut bacteria and allowing them to produce good things like short chain fatty acids, such as butyrate. Yeah, is there such a thing as a, a you know brain healthy diet? Like, should we just be eating tons and tons of fiber? Will that make us you know smarter or happier? Like, you know, what's a way to kind of optimize your diet for your brain health? We we know that foods that are high in antioxidants and, and flavonoids can have beneficial effects on the brain, and and uh, certainly fiber is good to consume. But but again, we really know more about what not to eat than than what's uh, beneficial for the brain. And there's a lot of evidence showing that foods that are high in saturated fatty acids and sugars can negatively impact uh, the brain, in particular, this brain region called the hippocampus that I mentioned earlier. So this brain region is somewhat of a canary in the coal mine in that it's very, uh, the neurons in this brain are very metabolically active. And it seems to be one of the first regions to be impacted by diet and metabolic factors. And a uh, high sugar diet, for example, can have a negative impact on the hippocampus, particularly when consumed, at least from preclinical animal model data during early life periods of development. What about supplements? You know, there's a lot of prebiotics and probiotics in the market these days. Is that doing anything to influence our gut health um, and, and our gut microbiome? Like, is that something that you all would recommend or are we not quite there yet? Yeah, so you know, probiotics are really the, the products that contain live culture or live microbes, such as bacteria. Um, you've probably seen these in yogurts, um, fermented foods, things like that. And the idea is that you're consuming certain microbes that could um, alter or, or influence your gut health in, an, in a positive way. And prebiotics, which Scott already mentioned, are, are somewhat different. These are items that are such as fiber that can really help to feed and thus grow. Um, ideally, the good bacteria in the gut. Um, the question, yeah, do these do these things work? I think there's a lot of research going on right now on this topic, but I think the jury is still out. Um, and there's really a lot of factors to to consider here um, on the individual level. So we need to learn a lot more about what types of bacteria are beneficial and under what conditions um, in terms of other health or gut conditions. Um, how much of these items would really need to be consumed and how they interact with other um, dietary or environmental factors. So I guess I would say, you know, we, <laughs> the short answer would be, I think we, we're just not there yet and we don't really know enough about this to, um, to know, you know, the long-term consequences of these things. Um, yeah. If I could just expand off that, it, it's important to note that these supplements are not regulated by the FDA. Um, so the, the, you know, take, take what it says on the label. Uh, there may be some research backing that claim up, but this hasn't been through rigorous uh, years in some cases of, of testing and clinical trials, and, and it's not regulated by the FDA. So it's important to keep that in mind. It's not saying that the, the science behind the claim for these supplements doesn't exist. It's just saying that, as, as Lindsay was alluding to, we're just not quite there yet. Another product that I've started seeing on the market are tests for gut health or tests for your gut microbiome. Um, what can these tests tell us? You know, is this something that you should be getting at a doctor's office that can really tell you a lot about your gut health and even your brain health? Or yeah, like what is a, a microbiome test telling us these days? Yes, yeah, so these tests are, are basically um, what they do is they analyze uh, the types and the numbers of the microbes that you have in your gut um, through a stool sample. Um, but really, to the best of my knowledge, none of these tests have been FDA approved yet either. Um, and we really don't know how accurate they are. As I mentioned before, in, in the context of pre and probiotics, there's so many factors to consider, consider and so much individual variability um, that I think this is going to take a lot more research to kind of um, nail down. And so they're not really used currently at, to, to diagnose any health conditions at all. Um, 
think that's a sort of still in our future yet. Um, and just if I could add a little bit to that, um, it, one of the things that makes this so complex is we can say that this population of bacteria is correlated with some health outcome. But it's not just single populations. What's important in many cases is the ratios of, of other bacteria to different bacterial populations. And we just don't know enough yet. Um, these correlations may be indicative of causation. Uh, but again, it's not just looking at a single population of bacteria in isolation because they, the bacteria in our microbiome interact with each other. And we don't fully understand the nature of those interactions because this is such a new field of research. I feel like we can't have a conversation about the gut and about testing for things in your gut without mentioning fecal uh, microbiota transfers. So what exactly is a fecal transplant? Why would someone undertake this? Um, please, uh, you know, enlighten us. Dana, people are eating. <laughs> um, yeah, so it, it's sort of a kind of a disgusting thing to think about, but but it's important. Um, it's been used in veterinary medicine for decades, essentially mechanism unknown, uh, but it has started to be used more in, in humans based on this syndrome called C. diff colitis, uh, C. difficile colitis, which is irritation, severe irritation in the lower gut that typically comes after antibiotic treatment. So antibiotics uh, kill all kinds of bacteria indiscriminately, and that includes, in some cases, good bacteria that help keep C. diff, which is bad bacteria, in check. And the pharmaceutical treatments for C. diff really aren't very effective. And this is a very severe syndrome that can even lead to death in some cases. What is effective, and this is, again, a relatively new development, is fecal transfer, which is typically done through a colonoscopy type approach. And this has about a 90% effective rate for C. diff. And it doesn't have to be to keep recurring. It's it's sort of a one and done in most cases, not in all, but uh, it's typically one fecal transfer uh, in from a donor who has healthy bacteria, uh, including the population that keeps C. diff in check, is enough to to cure C. diff in many cases. There's also emerging interest for fecal transfer in treating other autoimmune syndromes such as Crohn's disease and irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, we're not quite there yet in terms of medical application, but there is certainly a uh, promise for having fecal transfer as an effective medical treatment for particularly syndromes that involve the lower gut. I'm sorry to, to stay on the topic of fecal transplants, but I just think they're so fascinating. Um, and I understand that you're both you know, researching this in your lab, you know, beyond kind of the application for C. diff. Um, what are some other reasons that people might be, or researchers like yourself might be exploring fecal matter transplants? In our research, fecal matter transplants can be useful to identifying whether bacterial populations have causal effects on a particular outcome. So in my laboratory, we study how dietary factors during early life development influence cognition later in life. And I mentioned earlier that a high sugar diet can lead to uh, changes in the gut microbiome. And in one case, we were able to identify a population of bacteria that was elevated by excessive sugar consumption, and that was negatively correlated with memory function. So what we were able to do was then take other animals who had never consumed sugar and enrich this type of bacteria. And we were essentially able to replicate the memory impairments associated with excessive sugar consumption during early life development. So in that case, this approach is using as is used as a research mechanism to try to identify what changes in the microbiome are indeed leading to memory impairments. The flip side of that can also be used. So in some cases, bacteria are missing, are absent after a certain diet manipulation. And that absence may be important for something like learning and memory function. And in that case, rather than enriching that population to produce a bad outcome, this would be uh, sort of enriching that population to reverse it being eliminated from the unhealthy diet. And then you can look at whether that enrichment has a functional impact on behavior or metabolic function. Um, I'm really fascinated by this. Is it possible to alter your microbiome um, 
as dramatically just through diet changes or would it really have to be an FMT to kind of completely wipe everything out and start over? You, you can change the microbiome certainly from dietary changes, but we just don't know enough about it yet, as we've mentioned. Like Lindsay was talking about uh, probiotics. There's no evidence that the bacteria and yeast populations in these probiotics actually uh, colonate permanently with, with the gut microbiome. So you can think of it as, uh, yes, your diet can change your microbiome, but it's not as if uh, a single meal is going to have a long-term change on, on the bacterial population. Do you think about it more of a long-term change in, in diet rather than a, acute drastic effects from, from single meals? Yeah, and I think related to that, we just don't know enough about, yeah, how much and, and how long these need to be, how often, how much, how long these need to be consumed in order to sort of take hold. So I think that that's a big kind of empirical question out there. Um, will be important to kind of, Further, the our understanding about how how diet can um, potentially reshape the microbiome. We've got some great questions that are coming in from the audience, um, and just to stick on the topic of prebiotics and probiotics, um, real quick, uh, Dr. Sharon, I'm curious, you know, what's the difference between a probiotic and a prebiotic? Um, you know, other than just what it says, you know, on the label at the pharmacy, what's actually different in terms of how our gut microbiomes respond or um, even the types of foods that might contain these. Yeah, so the pro, they're, they're sort of used, um, they're, they're both, the goal, I guess, with both of them would be to kind of influence the the good uh, microbes that are in the gut um, to sort of further enhance the the good microbes that are in the gut. Um, and But they do this in different ways. So probiotics are um, foods that actually contain bacteria, for example, um, other live uh, microbes, um, that as you consume them, the idea is that they will then um, get into your gut. So these are found in things like yogurts, fermented foods, um, with the hope that they would then sort of colonize and, and um, take up residence there and, and you know, provide the benefit there. Uh, but as we were just mentioning, it's hard, you know, it's hard to know yet um, how well these work because we just don't know enough about sort of the dosing and, and how much you need and, and how these interact with other aspects of your diet. Um, and, um, and I think Scott made a really important point that a lot of these influences on health are based on kind of the ratio of these different types of um, bacteria in the gut. Um, so prebiotics, on the other hand, are, are items in your food or things in your food um, that are sort of potentially um, could benefit or, or feed the good bacteria in your gut or in, and in that way grow the good bacteria in your gut. So oftentimes these are things like fibers that are very difficult for us to digest, but which the good, the, those bacteria can feed on um, and utilize and, and will help them sort of stick around and, and colonize in the gut. So they're, they're, I guess it's the same endpoint, the same goal, but they do this through different mechanisms. And if I could add a little bit to that, one of the challenges with understanding the connections between pre and probiotics and, and gut microbiome is that the fecal content is really not a window into the microbiome that's in our intestines. Um, so the, the bacterial populations in the intestines are really quite different from what is used or what is basically used for sampling in these tests, which is from fecal matter. In preclinical animal models, you can get the microbiome essentially from the intestines. And if you sequence it from the fecal microbiome, they're really quite different. And, and what many people think is what's more important to health and disease outcomes is, is the bacterial population that are in the intestines and not necessarily what's coming out in the fecal content. We've got a couple more questions about how diet in particular is influencing our health. Um, one that came in is whether the time that we eat makes any difference. And I know that, you know, circadian rhythms have a huge impact on our health. So I'm curious if there's any influence between, you know, meal timing either early in the day, late in the day, you know, some people are doing intermittent fasting where they only eat for a small window, you know, yeah, if there's any research on how kind of the timing of a meal, not just its contents influences our gut and our brain health. 
there, there's certainly a lot of research on intermittent fasting, time re restricted eating, and effects on body weight. Uh, so can this type of eating be effective as a weight loss mechanism? And there is some evidence that that these approaches can be beneficial, but the effects are are really quite small. So it's it's not like taking a GLP-1 analog like Ozempic or Mount Jaro, um, changing when you eat and, and intermittent fasting is not going to have as large of effect on weight control as at least the pharmaceutical treatments that are available uh, today. But there is there is some research suggesting that there are some beneficial effects of of different eating schedules on on weight control. Uh, but again, these effects are, are relatively small relative to things like um, GLP-1 treatment or bariatric surgery. Another question we have is about the impact of alcohol uh, on our gut and our brain health. Um, I'm, we actually did a story at Well, my one of my colleagues did, um, about you know alcohol's effect on the gut microbiome. So I'm curious what you all think about that and, and how it's influencing us. I don't actually know much about that. I mean, I do know that it can influence the the colonies of bacteria in the gut, but I don't I don't know too much about how sort of the broader implications that for for gut health. Um, perhaps a related question because it's diving into our you know reward system and and why we like foods that are maybe bad for us. Um, you know, Dr. Shear, you talked about how those high sugar, high fat foods really activate that reward system in the brain. Why don't healthy foods activate that same system? Why aren't we getting that same, you know, response in, for a salad or quinoa that we do for, you know, a cookie or a piece of cake? Right. That's that's a good question. It seems like it would be adaptive um, for, for the brain to kind of translate healthier foods into um, the rewarding ones. That kind of, um, but I think you know, I, I think about it sort of in terms of an evolutionary perspective. Um, when, you know, we were sort of, we weren't in an environment where there were so many where energy dense foods, um, high sugar, high fat foods, we were searching around for foods and just sources of expedient sources of energy that we could get from our environment. And so being able to find those in the environment, extract those very efficiently from the foods that you're eating in, in order to get enough energy to feed the cells in your body and, and brain. Um, and then and also be able to remember where those um, types of energy dense foods are. I think that's sort of the environment that these systems grew up in or evolved in. Um, and it's only very recently that we're now in an environment where those things are generally pretty easy for most of us to get. Um, we can process foods to make them kind of higher in sugar and in fat content. And so, um, so looking at it more recently, it is seems maladaptive, but I think from a, the long view, it was probably a, a very adaptive way to be able to to locate and prioritize and find um, the foods that would that would give us enough energy, um, both immediately, but then in terms of energy to be able to store for times in which there wasn't um, usable food sources around. So, um, yeah. And, uh, I agree with all of that. And one thing that is, I think it's important to think about with regards to our attraction to sweet taste is that when our genome evolved, there wasn't fruit juice, there wasn't a soda, but there was fruit. And when you consume fruit, you're getting your carbohydrates, but also with fiber as well. Um, so what we've done in, in modern times, if we, we've processed food and we've taken the sweet parts out and added it to different things where it's not necessarily being consumed in the context of having fiber and, and the vitamins and other beneficial dietary components that are in fruit. Um, same with, with lipids. So we have a natu natural attraction to high lipid foods, which makes sense from an evolutionary perspective because there's more calories in fat than in carbohydrates or protein. Uh, but again, lipids consumed when we evolved were not necessarily in the form of processed um, fried, baked potatoes, et cetera, that we consume today with processed foods. I love this question that we just got in and I'm dying to know as well. Um, it puts you two a little bit on the spot, but I'm really curious, you know, how do you think about your diet when it comes to both your gut health and your brain health? You know, are there certain foods that you try to eat pretty consistently or anything that you really shy away from? I'm yeah, curious how your expertise and your research has influenced your own behaviors. I guess, yeah, anecdotally, I mean, I, I 
Um, I do find kind of related to the last question, if I do consume a lot of sugar, um, sugary foods that I do, that does sort of tend to make me feel not, not so great, a little kind of, um, I guess, lowers my kind of energy or, or, um, um, focus, things like that. I don't, again, I don't know that there's any, um, science behind that other than that's just sort of my general feeling. And, and I find that when I kind of reduce that actively and, um, consciously that, that I do end up feeling, um, better not in that way. So yeah, that's just one anecdotal piece of evidence, but. Some of my friends, uh, tease me when talking about our research because they're implying that there's nothing that they can eat, uh, that everything we, we study showing that there's a problem. Um, that's certainly not true, but uh, there are a lot of dietary factors that I would consume less of because of our research. Uh, and I'm actually a, a vegan, so I, that sounds like a healthy diet, but that said, there's certainly uh, junk food options for, for vegan food these days. So that doesn't necessarily imply a, a healthy diet, but I do try to consume foods that are high in fiber that are unprocessed um, and try to avoid heavily processed the term that's used today is ultra processed foods and we have a scale of is a food considered ultra processed versus unprocessed and there's four levels to the scale um, and as much as i can i try to avoid the the ultra processed foods but um occasionally i indulge as we all do i'm afraid or at least as i do um, these next couple of questions are a little bit less about the brain and more about how the gut influences other aspects of our health. You know, we talked about inflammation, um, and I'm really curious, and I think it's a great question, you know, how does our gut health influence things like autoimmunity, you know, whether that's, um, you know, conditions that are specific to the gut or just kind of immune system and immune reactions in general? I, I'm not really an expert in that area. I mean, there are certain autoimmune disorders that originate in the gut uh, with Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, um, also uh, type 1 diabetes, where there's impairments in insulin production and the beta cells is obviously connected to to metabolism and, and gut nutrition, but um, that's not something I'm an expert in. I'll tack one more question onto that. And again, totally understand if it's not your area of expertise, but there's also a question about um, gut health and cancer. Um, you know, we're seeing a huge rise right now in colon cancer, unfortunately, especially among younger adults. And I'm curious, again, if there's any um, research on kind of how our gut health and maybe our gut microbiome influence our risk for um, GI cancers. I think the links between gut health, microbiome, and cancer really get at, at the inflammation um, because cancer is very much correlated with, with pro-inflammatory signaling. And we are beginning to learn about bacterial populations that can be pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. And I think the, the connection between cancer is not a direct one, but rather one that's mediated through modulating inflammatory signaling. Um, taking us back to those kind of high sugar, high fat foods, you know, there's a question about, um, craving and the gut biome. Um, you know, is there evidence that kind of like a cyclical effect, like you were talking about Dr. Shear, where, you know, you eat a little bit of sugar and you want more, um, is that due more to the response in our brain and kind of targeting that reward system? Is there something specific about the gut microbes that are wanting more of it and kind of sending us that signal? And yeah, kind of curious how cravings work, uh, when it comes to our gut. Yeah, so I think I think there is um, at least in in animal studies some emerging data now that there is a link between the gut microbiome and these sort of the cravings or um, the rewarding aspects of food that we have. And in the evidence, again, these are really very recent studies, so I think there's a lot more to to find out about this. But um, the idea is, I think that there the way that these certain bacteria are working can actually suppress. Um, our, our craving or our want for certain types of really palatable hedonic foods. So that could be an interesting sort of future direction for maybe how to curb some of these um, appetites. And, um, but I think, again, we're not quite there yet, but there's definitely a link there and potentially through alterations in gut brain signaling um, as one of them, potentially alterations of um, 
some of these neurotransmitter systems that I was mentioning earlier on. So I think, yeah, I think there's definitely a link um, and, you know, how exactly and what particular types of foods and what aspects of the foods I think are all open questions, but. Um, and in addition to the microbiome, there's also a connection between the vagus nerve and, and craving. So an animal will press a lever to receive uh, vagus nerve stimulation, or they'll prefer to be in a location where they received vagus nerve stimulation. And the pathways have been mapped such that the information from the gut that's signaled to the brain through the vagus nerve, then downstreams communicates to the brain reward system. I mentioned the hippocampus as a, a target of the vagus nerve signaling from the gut, but the mesolimbic reward system where you have a uh, dopamine produced in the midbrain communicating to reward regions in the brain is also very much connected to the gut and the vagus nerve. This question is kind of piggybacking on the last one and, you know, I'm well aware there might not be any research uh, to back it up, but, you know, is there any sense that the things that you're craving are things that your body or your gut actually need? Um, you know, you could hear this, you know, as a, maybe a theory when women are pregnant that, you know, the things that you crave are actually what your body needs. Is there any evidence for that um, for, I guess, the rest of us, you know, most of the time? I think in general, it's been um, sort of difficult to, to tease out, um, you know, looking at individual nutrients and things like that. I think there's certain evidence, there's, there's strong evidence for um, certain cases like salt. When you're depleted of salt, there's a a strong, you sort of develop a very strong attraction to highly salty foods and fluids in order to replenish that. Um, but when it comes to like the macronutrients that you need, the carbohydrates, proteins, and the fats, maybe it's exception for proteins, but um, that's been a little bit more difficult to kind of provide, to find such a strong link. Um, and so one theory is one strategy that um, the brain or the body is using is to sort of just increase intake of all nutrients, sort of amplify or increase consumption of everything in order to be able to, to bring in more uh, energy in the form of calories, but also all of these other types of micronutrients. Um, and so protein might work a little bit differently. I think there's, uh, when you're um, missing certain amino acids, there does seem to be um, an increased, like strong attraction for foods that um, contain those, the, proteins or those amino acids. Um, We've just got a couple minutes left. And um, one thing I you know, want to ask you all is, you know, what are you excited about right now in this field? Like what's really um, fascinating you? You know, what are you really passionate in pursuing? Like what's, yeah, most, what's most intriguing to you right now in terms of the gut-brain connection? I'll start. Um... I'm really excited about the connection between the gut and, and the hippocampus because Alzheimer's and other dementias, we really have no effective cures for this. And the connection between the gut and hippocampus as it relates to dementia and Alzheimer's pathology is a, a very recent discovery. So we don't really understand the mechanisms yet for how the vagus nerve is promoting hippocampal function and, and potentially ameliorating the deficit seen in, in dementia. So that's really what I'm excited about right now, just given how um, there are no effective treatments, and this is a, an emerging biological mechanism that's poorly understood at this point in time. Yeah, and I'd say one thing I'm really interested kind of in the future of and seeing how it unfolds is this idea. We think, I think we've tended to think of these systems, um, you know, the, the vagus nerve signaling from the gut to the brain or um, our taste buds signaling um, about what we're consuming to the brain as, as really hardwired systems. I think I even called them hardwired systems um, earlier, uh, but they're really actually shaped by diet. And I guess we didn't touch on that as much as um, in this discussion, but they are influenced by our diet. And so, uh, for example, the types of um, taste receptor cells that we express are really influenced by how much sugar we consume um, or, or low calorie sweeteners we consume that and, and that influences the intensity of the, that information and signal getting to the brain. Um, and a similar thing is happening at the level of the gut where the, the foods that we're processing there are actually kind of shaping um, the sensitivity of that system 
um, to to food itself. So that that's sort of a future direction of my lab. And there, we alluded to, there's sort of vulnerable periods for this potentially early early in life, being um, and where most of the development of these systems are, are happening. Um, and so, trying to understand how the food environment influences things, and then you know how that influences our our eating behaviors throughout life, um, whether they can be reversed um, with other types of dietary interventions and things like that. So, I'm going to sneak in one more question, Dr. Knotsky, just because you piqued my interest. Um, I've been writing a lot about dementia, um, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on you know the connection between Mediterranean diet and potentially you know reducing the risk for dementia. Do you think that's through nutrients? Is there something going on with the vagus nerve there? Like, what's the connection between, you know, a, a brain healthy diet, I suppose, and, and risk for dementia? I, th I think with the Mediterranean diet, one key component is that there's not a lot of processed foods in a Mediterranean diet. It's not targeting necessarily a specific macronutrient, uh, but rather it's more of a, a holistic diet approach. Um, there's some evidence, as you mentioned, that there may be beneficial effects for a Mediterranean diet on, on dementia risk, but those data are not necessarily uh, cut and dry, it's it's an ongoing conversation. Um, I think one of the recent studies looking into this, it was a little bit disappointing, um, but in that in this type of research, um, different studies have different findings depending upon their approach and the questions asked. I think it's a little too early to say that, I wouldn't recommend that necessarily based on the evidence to date, uh, but that said, a Mediterranean diet can be uh, quite healthy if consumed appropriately. Great. Um, well, I think we're just about out of time. Thank you both so much. This has been an absolutely fascinating conversation. Um, if people want to find out more about your research, where can they find you online? Do you have lab websites or um, profiles? Yeah, where can they find about, uh, out more about the work you're doing? Yes, so um, so I have a lab website. It's sheerlabusc.com. Um, so I find out more about what we're doing there. And I, I do as well, uh, KanoskiLab.com. Um, great. And I know that science is very much a team effort. So I'm, you know, always want to give the opportunity to shout out, you know, the rest of your labs for all the work they do. Um, yeah, to, to keep kind of the science going. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh... <laughs> I don't spend a lot of time in the lab myself. Really, all of our research is from the very talented uh, undergraduates, graduate students, and, and postdoc trainees in the lab. I'm not going to name them all because I have a rather large lab, but um, they really are very talented young researchers at, at in my lab and at USC in general. Yeah, same thing. I think, um, yeah, they really move the science forward and um, make it fun and Great. Well, Dr. Knotsky, Dr. Shear, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. It's been really fascinating. I think we've all learned a lot. Um, and thank you to everyone for tuning in. We appreciate it.